Aloha, and welcome to the 12th installment of the POD podcast. Uh, as always, I'm your host, Reverend Jonathan Barlow G. Uh, tonight, we're going to be discussing time travel and the second installment of a series on such, uh, wherein I answer questions proposed on that topic by Andrus Lux. So without further ado, I'll get into the uh, the questions and answers right away. What is the nature of time? Change. From the point of view of a biological organism, the nature of time is to age, kill, and decay any and all forms of life. Time is seen, rightly, as the enemy of life and as a force of pure anti-life in itself. Insofar as life in itself is a good thing, then time, being brief when pleasant and lasting longest in pain, is evil because time causes all death and brings all life to its eventual and inevitable end. In people in particular, as an example of biological organisms, the psychological perception of time is especially subjective. From a consciously mortal point of view, time is always running out, never returning, but it seems to flow at different rates, at different times itself. The modern homo sapien rarely thinks their own interior biological clock or circadian rhythm may be independent of an otherwise always constant frame of time as an objective tempo. For example, due to conventional measurement of the concept, the Orient is 12 hours ahead of the New World because one hour is, nowadays, measured the same in both places. In other words, regardless of how time feels, it seems to pass at a single more or less fixed rate universally. This tempo we call time. Universally, time measures entropy. Entropy is defined as the degree of randomness in a system and as lack of predictability and decline into disorder. Consider this quote from Wikipedia about the second law of thermodynamics. Quote, the second law is concerned with the direction of natural processes. It asserts that a natural process runs only in one sense and is not reversible. That is, the state of a, nat of a natural system itself can be reversed, but not without increasing the entropy of the system's surroundings. That is, both the state of the system plus the state of its surroundings cannot be together fully reversed without implying the destruction of entropy." End quote. For an example of this being the case in the universe, consider that black holes form spiral galaxies of stars around their equatorial accretion disks, seemingly imposing ordo ab cal, by gravity causing energy to slow down and transform into various forms of matter, from stars to living cells. Outside these nebulae, galaxies, and clusters, however, the condition of entropy as matter speeding up into energy remains universal, as demonstrated by the redshift to observed galaxies outside our own, indicating all galaxies to be moving away from one another. This is called universal expansion, and believed to be due to the continuing effects of the primordial Big Bang. This distinction between 
universal expansion and increasing entropy outside of and around all the galaxies that are gravitationally decreasing entropy inside themselves is a clear demonstration of the second law of thermodynamics. In short, time as a measure of entropy provides a simple scale between twin binary polar extremes that is measured as entropy time is a scalar between low entropy usually associated with slowed motion and high entropy associated with excitation of motion a similar scalar is a common thermometer that measures between cool as a condition associated with low entropy and hot associated with high entropy in the case of the standard arrow of time associated with entropy it is reckoned that entropy always increases and will never decrease in short again the galaxies may provide temporary local decrease of entropy but their existence increases the remainder of universal entropy outside of them overall. What are the better and worse timelines according to your models? If we define what is good as what is beneficial to the survival of life and what is evil as whatever is harmful or detrimental to that, then it stands to reason that there is a better and a worse possible situation for every individual and for all life collectively at any given moment. And thus, there is a trend implied toward a better or worse possible future for every individual and for all life in general as well. Because life as we know it now does not occur anywhere else outside Earth so far as we are currently aware, this concept of a better and a worse possible timeline is purely applicable to Earth. So the fates of all living beings and the fate of planet Earth are inextricably intertwined. Thus, we can say every living being individually and Earth as a whole in general, may conceivably have a better or a worse possible future. But we cannot say this about the solar system, the galaxy, or the universe. Our observation of morality is solely from the perspective of living biological organisms in this case, not that of astrophysics. So if there is a better possible future for Earth, and a worse possible future for Earth, and consequently for every living being, what do these look like? Well, for starters, it is very difficult for most people to formulate their own idea of a utopia or ideal society because the concerns of surviving in the present distract them from idle leisure and contemplation of such philosophical abstracts. As a result of not formulating their own better world for themselves, most civilized people end up accepting the dystopias or worse ideas for society that other, likewise stunted, futurists hand down. However, if one creates a moderately better society in the short term, it can lead to a much better society in the longer term future. This can only be imagined let alone accomplished, by remaining open-minded to the ideal of a utopia being possible and consulting with others of like mind on the subject about how an ideal society could best be defined. In theory, the ideal utopia in the better future is always equidistant to an equivalent dystopia opposite it in the worst parallel possible timeline. According to the apparent rise and fall of these timelines relative to one another, actually their orbit around one another in a proverbial double helix, there also exists a third possible timeline 
consisting of the averaging out of these extremes, uh, mainstream timeline where we all usually exist, in which society is as slow to change as technology is fast, and in which little ever changes about the structure of society, even over the vast aeons of human history. This mainstream timeline acts like a flat spine between the twin better and worse possible timelines that revolve around it, such that the proximity of these parallel dimensional timelines to apparent intersection, seen two-dimensionally, influences the rise and fall of societies, cultures, and technologies in the mainstream timeline. When these parallel timelines appear to converge, there is increased space weather in the solar system, increased climate change on Earth, and increased novelty among people and their artifacts. When these timelines appear to diverge furthest apart, these effects all appear slowed. Thus, this effect may be related to the sunspot cycle, etc. There will always be a better and a worse possible future timeline, so long as there remains a mainstream timeline. However, there might not always be a mainstream timeline. In the event the mainstream timeline ends, there may be a delay before the other, better and worse timelines are affected by this and end themselves. Does changing outcomes in the past or future create new timelines? Yes, choices always create new timelines, even in the present. Given the many worlds hypothesis for a multiverse of countless possible parallel dimensional timelines, for the individual time traveler who moves a chair, alters the past or future, their doing so creates a causality ripple that spreads throughout that timeline, gradually branching it away from its original course. These causality ripples can be detected by microwave gravitational pulse echolocation, in theory, allowing a stationary observer in one timeline to be able to find paradoxes caused by time travelers in nearby parallel or bifurcating timelines to their own. Once a new timeline begins to diverge from an existing one, any attempts to correct its course back to its original run the risk of colliding their new timeline into the mainstream version of the timeline they left behind. In biological branching patterns, different branches from different trunks exhibit crown shyness to avoid overlapping one another. However, there does not appear to be any similar check on growth of divergently branching timelines. So let us say a time traveler arrives in the past and moves a chair. This begins a causality ripple, or temporal echo, emanating outward from that event that triggers, as a chain reaction, a series of events that will tend toward differentiating this new timeline from its predecessor. Just as any attempt to reconverge timelines at this stage will remerge the new and original timelines in unpredictable ways, the timelines themselves will tend to distinguish and differentiate from one another on their own. In short, they either branch apart or else they branch back together and, perhaps ironically, it is safer for them to branch apart than to try to recombine, because doing so could cause unpredictable changes to both. The nature of these causality ripples is such that, at first, the effects of the time traveler altering the timeline will be localized to their immediate location and situation. But this process will, if left unchecked, 
eventually spread out to influence the divergence of an entire universal timeline. This gradual spreading out throughout all space-time indicates that the effect of the causality ripple may be experienced by one observer earlier than another. This lag in apparent realities, wherein one observer lives in the unaltered original version and another in an already altered version, results in distortions to how the same event may be perceived, interpreted, and experienced by different individuals. As Nietzsche put it, the same effects in man and woman never cease to differ in tempo, so disagreements between them will never end. So it is with all people that their individual biorhythms rarely synchronize with one another, and so, as Nietzsche put it, they never cease to argue. These biorhythms can be influenced by causality ripples without the individual knowing it. Divergent timeline branches tend to have increased entropy from their parent mainstream or original timeline trunk, and so tend to terminate sooner than it. What is the T4 model exactly? In this case, the term T4 is short for theoretical time travel technology. So the T4 model is a means of mapping time and navigating time travel. T4 essentially deals with time travel models that are not strictly adherent to the standard arrow of entropy model alone. It is primarily concerned with the geometry of time and, in particular, time loops, or so-called closed time-like curves. In terms of temporal cosmology, T4 proposes that hyperspace, surrounding and permeating the local universe at faster-than-light speeds, is itself a closed time-like curve or self-perpetuating time loop. T4 proposes the shape of this fourth spatial dimension is a torus, regardless of the shape of the fourth spatial dimension, when it is combined with the three dimensions of local universal space to comprise the fabric of 4D space-time. This is expressed as a natural iteration along the same progression as the singularity being 1D, the circle being 2D, the sphere being 3D, and thus the torus 4D. In the local universe, we find the torus everywhere. A spiral galaxy forms into a flat plane of billions of spherical stars, all being pulled around and inward toward a gravitational singularity. In each such galaxy, an electromagnetic torus connects the poles of the core black hole to the poles of every star in orbit around it. Modern theorists call this a black hole's hair. We can also find the torus in the shape of hyperspace, where it occurs as a nested sphere within a sphere, where the external sphere is hyperspace, and the interior sphere is the local universe. In this T4 model, a single local parent universe can exist that buds off countless offspring or baby universes that protrude out into the hyperspace layer surrounding the surface of this local universal sphere within a sphere. T4 proposes that one can plot a course using a black hole to alter one's trajectory, that can conceivably not only break free from local universal space-time to enter fourth-dimensional hyperspace, but may even escape this to realms beyond the local cosmos entirely. By way of demonstrating the shape of time, 
to be a Taurus. The T4 model proposes considering past and future as the lesser radii of the Taurus and the present as its centroid. Where the Taurus of time is a closed system, as with the CTC, any change to one of these, past, present, or future, affects a change on them all. If the past were to increase, the future would commensurately increase as well, and the present would necessarily shrink. Just so, if the present were to expand, past and future must shrink, etc., because such is the geometry of this closed set. This model is not necessarily the only, let alone the final, proposed for understanding the nature of time by the theoretical time travel technology program. It is simply one of the more approachable from a novice standpoint. My tesseract of time tra diagram, labeled Dao sub Dao, is another possible manner for modeling time, but incorporates the double cube of ancient Kabbalah in addition to the double sphere torus. The sphere, the, the square or cube or tesseract, and the circle or sphere or torus are simply two different expressions describing the same area. The square is a measurement, a flat right angle, and the circle describes the terrain itself, plotted by a compass. What technology is required for physical time travel? At present, purely theoretical technology is the only known kind that exists to allow for physical time travel. The flux capacitor in the Back to the Future movies, in this regard, is only less plausible a MacGuffin device enabling time travel than the double-care black hole engine of alleged time traveler John Teeter, because it is not as fully schematically described. And here, again, we come back to the Montauk chair in the supposed Montauk project disclosures. Supposedly, the Montauk chair arrangement consisted of a pilot's seat between twin Tesla coils opposite a portal construct, that is, a simple screen onto which to project the pilot's thoughts. This design, we're told, was based on the Philadelphia Experiment arrangement of the coils along the upper deck of the USS Eldridge that created a time tunnel perpendicular to their alignment. The accounts of Bob Lazar can also not be entirely dismissed from this category. His descriptions of a small reaction tower and collapsible flexible waveguide for housing fuel element 115 as an engine to generate anti-gravity propulsion may be just science fiction for now, but the premise will eventually be explored further and results are bound to demonstrate either proof for his claims or to refute them. While Lazar's lenticular discraft models for anti-gravity flight may not immediately seem related to time travel technologies. However, wherever anti-gravity appears, there is also the potential for time travel becoming involved as well. Gravity organizes energy into matter, and so it is neg-entropic. Therefore, what is anti-gravity is pro-entropy, and vice versa, what is pro-gravity is anti-entropy. In short, any anti-gravity drive that may be used for propulsion through space, particularly FTL, may also be turned around into an anti-entropy drive and used for propulsion through time. All this being said, modern theoreticians describe the probably easiest means of ripping open space-time 
to involve using exotic matter to stabilize the core circumference of a wormhole that could then be targeted to open at one end in the here and now and at the opposite end to open onto some far distant location at some different time. It is highly likely the best design for real time travel technology will combine aspects from all these models. My own certainly do. How will time travel affect the human nervous system? Time travel in a very local, very limited form is already being practiced, and so we can see what effect this has on the nervous system of people who undergo it even now, and thus make predictions, right or wrong, about how longer time travel trips might affect a person as well. If you get into an airplane and fly across several time zones and get out, you will experience what is called, colloquially, jet lag. Studies done on jet lag find it arises due to the hippocampus's endocrine secretions falling out of their usual circadian rhythm. This causes all the other autonomically functioning systems to each fall into its own tempo, and this pattern of multipolarity in terms of one's bodily clock results in the disorientation, fatigue, and inflammation one feels collectively as symptoms of jet lag. Of course, the longer the trip, the more alien the chronological environment will be when one arrives, and thus the greater their degree of jet lag. Likewise, the shorter the trip, the less the symptoms are likely to persist. This much, at least, can easily be predicted to be holographically transferable from simple airplane travel to deep space travel at FTL speeds, let alone travel through time itself. After all, time travel is nowhere specified as being necessarily exclusive to travel through time by itself. One can time travel and space travel in one and the same trip. In fact, we do almost, in fact, we almost all do so almost every day. When you get in your car and drive to or from work, you're traveling through space and time both, albeit not outer space on a journey of so great a distance as, say, to the moon and back. The lunar distance from Earth is, on average, approximately 385,000 kilometers, that is 239,000 miles, or 1.28 light seconds. This is roughly 30 times Earth's diameter, or 9.5 times Earth's circumference. Nevertheless, Earth's equatorial circumference is around 40,075 kilometers, 24,901 miles, which is actually less than the mileage on many people's vehicles. Also, when one is driving at 60 miles per hour, one is driving a mile a minute. This is the same premise as a light year, being both a measure of distance and a duration at the fixed rate of light speed. How does one apply cartography to time travel? Well, again, time travel is not necessarily confined to being travel along the time axis only. It can also be combined with space travel over both long and short distances. So, for example, say you wanted to plan a car trip from point A to point B. Well, you would look at what roads took you what way. Some roads may be larger and thus faster, as well as more direct. Other roads may be more rustic and thus slower, as well as more winding. So you plot your choice of way to go, 
And this is planning the distance metric or the space part of your trip. If you want to know how long it will take you to get to your destination, you will have to look at what the speed limits are on the roads you chose to take and decide your pace accordingly. This is the duration metric or the time part of planning one's trip. So that is a basic example of how one can use a map to plan a trip through both space and time. Just the same if one wants to travel at FTL speeds from planet A to planet B, one has to plot a course that avoids all mass shadows, gravity wells, and other forms of distortion to space-time that, that might impede one's way. In order to do this, one has to have up-to-date stellar cartography files that chart the local terrain of the space-time continuum, including, especially, all potential pitfalls. So, again, because travel at the fixed rate of light speed, one Planck distance per one Planck time, is similar to going 60 miles per hour or a mile a minute, the duration of one's trip at such a velocity depends more upon whether one chooses to go the long way or the short way in terms of distance. For the briefest trip, one travels the fastest speed on the most direct and shortest distance roads. The process of mapping space-time is essentially the same as making a geographic map of the surface of Earth, however, in Outer space, the obstacles one may encounter are rarely aligned along a horizontal planar surface, but will need to be gone around in any of the six possible directions of three space. Such stellar cartography and road maps are still mostly maps of space, though, not so much of time alone. A true time map would not just plot the present locations of changing conditions, such as space weather or terrestrial climate patterns, but be symbolic of the topography and terrain of time, the seventh direction of local space-time, as a thing in itself. A time map would have to reduce time by one dimension from what it is measuring, just as a map of 3D space represents this on a plain 2D surface. Therefore, because time is at least one half of the fourth spatial dimension, a map of time that is required to reduce the terrain by one dimension to represent it pictographically would be a three-dimensional map. Perhaps this implies only a moving 3D hologram is sufficient to represent the change that defines time and a lesser, flat, 2D time map may be impossible. Then again, a flip book with a timeline animated along the edges of its flat 2D pages may be able to accomplish the trick by way of optical illusion, even if not being a precisely accurate depiction. It may be difficult to explain a time map to one who's never imagined one as a concept, but technically a calendar is one already particularly the planetary ephemeris of phases and alignments associated with the local planets relative to the position of Earth. These prove immensely important in both mental-only, remote viewing types of time travel experiments, but also in actual time jumps from one location on Earth's surface to another across a vast duration of time. Over time, the Earth changes locations in outer space, so one appearing at just the right place in space and time is essential to surviving a time jump. Ten kilometers undershot, and you could appear floating outside Earth's atmosphere. Five meters overshot, and you could appear buried alive underground or half immersed in a bulkhead like allegedly happened to the sailors of the USS Eldridge during the Philadelphia experiment. What do these types what do these type of navigation systems look like in the future? 
That depends on which futurist you ask, and when. George Lucas, creator of Star Wars, imagined a hyperdrive engine as a large, flat, upright plaque of exposed complex circuitry. Stanley Kubrick had also imagined his aliens as being large, flat, upright planks, though in his case entirely flat ebony. Lucas created the aged future motif in science fiction, giving all his futuristic designs wear and tear from prior use to make them look more authentically realistic. Prior to Lucas, science fiction ships and props were usually all very sleek and shiny, looking like they'd just been manufactured, because, of course, they had. The study of retrofuturism, or past ideas about the aesthetics of possible future times, indicates that, for example, even the shape of UFOs and the appearance of aliens has changed and evolved over time. In the 1800s, airships were seen resembling cigar-shaped blimps. In the 1940s, Foo Fighters were witnessed in the aerial theater of war. In the 1950s, the flying saucer flap took hold. In the first decade of the 21st century, most appearances of UFOs were as large, apparently shape-shifting geometrical forms. Nowadays, they are reported as tiny tic-tacs that routinely disobey the local laws of physics on military radar. Following World War II, science fiction became increasingly dystopian in its prophetic visions for humanity's future, and futurist authors who weren't ground down by the evil machinations of a globalist empire during this time were few and far between. In his novel, Dune, Frank Herbert imagined the space-bending navigation guild pilots as highly evolved but freakishly alienated creatures who opened wormholes telekinetically. Personally, I think a time machine's CPU will likely be found to resemble a standard geode, a crystalline structure inside a mineral-encrusted orb. The prismatic, hexagonal structures of the crystal's molecular composition may serve as an ideal place for storing a holographic star chart. Most cell phones are still using a liquid crystal display screen technology, even for their touchscreen interface models, so it is possible to utilize this trait of crystals for the purpose of magnification of an illuminated image. Exactly how one would imprint or extract celestial coordinates from inside of a geode without being able to crack it open to penetrate its surface, however, remains a mystery above my pay grade. Likewise, my own UFO-slash-time machine schematics remain sufficiently futuristic as to be well above my pay grade to construct one myself, even drone scale. Can you describe your own designs for time traveling? Gladly. The difficulty with long-duration space-time trips is the airlessness of outer space, but this is only a difficulty for the physical, biological body. Therefore, if one wants to bring their body along on a trip through hyperspace or through time, they will need a ship. My own schematics for such a ship are of a lenticular, disc-shaped design for a saucer about 20 meters 65.6 feet in diameter. It has cockpit seating for three and hypersleep pods for three, allowing a possible crew of up to six. It has three decks, the lowest being a cargo bay, the middle being the engineering and habitat ring, and the top being the cockpit. The engine consists of an electromagnetic tube torus, inside of which is a metal sphere, inside of which, floating in a solution, is a geode, which appears to serve as the ship's onboard navigational computer system. 
The ship's propulsion system consists of three gyroscopes housed at the centers of toroidal electromagnetic coils. Fiber optic like wires comprise the rest of the ship's interior, connecting every component to every other and serving as both a Faraday cage, protecting the occupants from electromagnetic radiation outside of as well as generated by the craft, and as a means of breaking the craft gradually by dispersing absorbed Cherenkov radiation, thus generating an inertial damper field. The interface panels of the cockpit are entirely functional are entirely functionally useless in the absence of a telepathic pilot able to activate the craft. I never intend to pilot this device myself. I just think it's an interesting thought experiment. At least. There are, of course, easier ways to transport one's physical biological body across a vast duration of time if one does not need to contend with the airless vacuum of outer space. For example, if one can construct a portal device to open a stable wormhole between any given location, the here and now, and any other location, some other place and or time, one can effectively poke a hole through the time barrier and begin moving freely between one place in space-time and another through this time tunnel. Given possession of such a device, the most logical use of it would apparently be, as I once mentioned to Peter Moon, to construct the past to fortify the future. In other words, I would suggest opening a large enough time tunnel portal to Western Antarctica some 4.2 million years ago to establish a firm base at that location and time to serve as a way station for the development of other similar deep underground bases and to act as a spaceport and outpost for further time travel research. These other distant, uh, these other bases established in the distant past could be strategically abandoned to be rediscovered at random intervals by subsequent evolving peoples, only to be forgotten again and lost to time until eventually someone would finally understand their purpose and use them to develop time travel technology in order to go back to the past and create them to begin with. Again, I have no interest in carrying all this out, even if I could. I just think it is an interesting premise for a plot line, and so I am working to develop it into a strategic time travel themed RPG. Doesn't that sound fun? What are the limitations of this technology, and what surpasses it? The obvious limitation to any form of long-distance space and or long-distance the obvious limitation to any form of long-distance space and or long-duration time trip is in bringing one's physical biological body along for the ride. Although this may seem absurd, even to most modern minds, this is not necessarily the only way to attain the same results. If present people can evolve to become beings of pure mental energy only, pure psi patterns arising and teleporting themselves about through the ZPE field of hyperspace, then it may be possible for such energy beings to manifest physical biological bodies at the original location and target destination while between this reverting to forms of pure tachyon light, if, that is, they'd even be so inclined as to ever be biological again. After all, if one can become an immortal soul, and as such they can instantly transport themselves anywhere in the cosmos, past, present, or future, this would be infinitely easier than bringing along their physical biological body with them in a ship. And that wraps up the 12th edition of the 
Pythagorean Order of Death or POD podcast, the second installment on time travel, uh, being questions asked to me, your host, Reverend Jonathan Barlow G by Andrus Lux. And so uh, just as we began with little fanfare, let's end with little fanfare as well and say uh, till next time and peace. <laughs>